Kristen Gus. Uh, I'm in the biology department, and where's JJ? <laughs> I feel really honored to be to participate in this event. So thank you. Um, so when I this is gonna be a little JJ love fest moment. For me. <laughs> so, but you know, JJ remembers the pictures of the horses. Um, and when I think of JJ, JJ and I bonded over uh, our shared love of chickens. Um, because we use uh, chickens in my classes, and JJ has grew up on a farm. Or my, mom, least, my mom would like to think that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, uh, and, and um, I, okay, before I get into the JJ Love Fest, let me, let me just say that, that each one of us up here, so I'm just going to tell you, I feel very vulnerable because each one of us who's agreed to do this today and the people who are playing the instruments in the corner, when you, when you, reveal, when you, when you reveal something about your process or your personality or your creativity, you make yourself vulnerable. And, um, I, and JJ, I guess when I feel like I really get to know people is when they make themselves vulnerable. And um, JJ was talking about chicken development in my class, and she talked about how she, they, they had these chickens and the eggs, and you have to turn the eggs, and like, I feel like I really got to know her um, through that, because she shared something personal with me. Um, and I guess I, um, JJ used the phrase, what's motivate, what motivates your do, and I, and that's over there too, so I, I, I'm happy to see that I just didn't manufacture this. So I thought a lot about what motivates my do, um, and so I, I have, I actually came up as a result of preparing my comments for today, what my big, my big do's are. Um, stretch, challenge, balance, have fun. And so I hope that in, in taking the circuitous route through my comments, you'll see how I actually realized that as a result of putting these comments together. So at first when I agreed to do this event with JJ, I thought this is, okay, this could be so easy. I'm just gonna talk about sources of inspiration. Um, but then I realized that when I do some formal speaking, of which I do a lot, I usually have some kind of a shield I have, I mean, my favorite shield is biology. Um, so I have the topic for the, for, the, for the day's class. I have some topic to discuss in department meeting. I have just a topic to discuss with friends, whatever it is. I have, I have some shield. But um, today, there's no shield. It's just me and my creative process. But I will, I will also add that I very much appreciate um, spinning a good yarn. So I, I actually don't like, I, I know that in class we call them lecture, but I'll just tell you that when I'm at home getting ready for class, I think, how can I spin this into a good yarn? So I see the value, the value of this. All right, so I still, I still need to come up with something to say. Um, and so I, I thought a lot about what, what motivates my do, and then I thought, what, what do I actually do? What don't I do? And so I decided to tell you a little bit, starting to tell you a little bit about what, what I actually do. So this is what's, these are the little do's that have led me to my big do's of stretch, challenge, balance, and have fun. So I just kind of kept track of what I do each day. So I try to get up early. And I've learned about myself that uh, my most productive hours are before it's light, actually, before my brain and the day have started to distract me from myself. And I've learned this, I've learned this about myself. Um, but I'll tell you that this, this sounds very good, but it's not all fairy tales and unicorns. Um, I also do procrastinate. So I often have last minute prep to do for class, spinning that good yarn, or department meeting, or other campus responsibilities or even to clear the surfaces in my home for my cleaning service. So that's right, I don't even clean my own house. I live in a yellow house on Elm Street, but I love. 
I could clean my own house, I could do a good job, and I know this because I've earned money cleaning houses, but I've learned that I feel like my time at home is better spent um, doing something else. Um, I mean, I, I know the value of cleaning a dirty bathroom and making it clean, but I would rather spend my time just doing something else at home, whether it's getting ready for class or I like to putter, I find things on the curb, I clean them up, I put them in my house. I would describe my decorating style as curb cottage, <laughs> mixed with cool scientific glassware and some maps and some scientific figures. Um, but these are kind of puttering things that relax my mind and help give me balance. So that's one of my, my big dudes. I do run every day. I have been a lifelong athlete, and you'd be amazed at how hard it takes, it, it, how challenging it is for me to say that. It feels like it's bragging. But when I look at the data, um, I, for the, I'm 46 years old, and for the past 40 years, I've always had something that I do. It started with swimming. My mother had three little kids who drove her crazy in Billings, Montana, and so she took us to the YMCA. She started us in swimming lessons, or she taught us in the bathtub. I'm not sure, I don't remember far, back that far. But pretty soon we were on the swim team, and I just kept swimming. Um, I still swim. It happens more seasonally for me because I really like to swim outside, laps outside, and Carlisle actually has a beautiful outdoor pool in the summer. Only 25 yards, but it's nice. At some point, I kind of gave up swimming for downhill skiing, and I restarted that last year after about 20 years away. During that time, I cross-country skied, both Nordic and skate skiing. I ride a road bike. About two years ago, I started practicing yoga. I'm better at some of these things than others. Uh, I don't do most in any kind of a fantastic way, but I do all with reasonable ability. But running's always been kind of in my life. Um, and I'm very lucky to have the best running buddy in the world in Missy Niblock. About six weeks ago, I made the commitment to run every day, and it's going pretty well. I missed about, I've missed six days, and two of those I was downhill skiing in Colorado. So, <laughs> so I, I do these things because they make me feel better. Um, and little successes really do build. If I can put one foot in front of the other for half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour, I might be able to do something else that feels more challenging. So when you think about it, that's like when I tell myself, I don't want, I don't want to run today. I think, okay, all I have to do is put one foot in front of the other for this time period. And my, my minimum time for myself is two miles. I'm like, you can do that for 20 minutes. You've been to graduate school. You can do lots of things today. <laughs> But that's not all fairy tales and unicorns either, because um, I eat way too many Cheez-Its. <laughs> Provolone Cheez-Its are amazing, um, so I'm, I eat at the Hamilton too often. I'm trying to burn those off, um, and my core strength is feeble, but I'm working on that too. But the motivation for running, it's like a reset button, and it's it's like it can get me ready, or it can shake off the day, gear up or calm down, sometimes both at the same time, so that's, that's balance. I do love a yellow dog named Chi Chi. So those of you who know me, or have had a class with me, know my dog Chi Chi, you've seen a picture of my dog Chi Chi, she's the best dog ever. Um, it's amazing how <laughs> How happy yellow fur on everything and being licked on the nose by somebody who has extremely bad breath can make you feel. Um, my personal life is otherwise quiet right now after two years of higher activity, but my dog and my mom and my dad and my sister and my brother and my Carlisle pack um, and my childhood friends um, and my yellow dog, I feel like their, their good energy and their love is kind of rolled up in that yellow dog and that one is all rainbows and unicorns. And that's, that's balance, too. I do collect virgins. So um, that's always fun to say. So um, I, I did it this morning, and I'm going to do it again this afternoon. So I work on fruit fly development, um, both my research and my teaching. 
and to establish controlled matings, one needs to use females that have not yet mated, so the paternity of the offspring is known. Otherwise, it's the bug version of Jerry Springer's show. <laughs> so my motivation for that is that at core, I'm a scientist. And really what that means is I'm very curious about a very small set of things. And I am very lucky, I mean so, so lucky, to have a job that allows me to investigate those things. But the best part of my job is that I get to share those interests with an audience. And sometimes those people become curious too. And then we get to spend time just reveling in the joy that is biology. And of course, that audience I'm talking about is my students. My motivation is not just to answer the question for myself, but also to share my interest with others. My, I think my love of biology comes not only from making the new discoveries, but having the opportunity to share those. It's like, it's like playing an instrument. It's more fun when you have an audience. But it's fun to just jam alone also. Um, I've never really understood the motivation of people who go door to door to talk about the religion, but I guess that's, I got to do the same thing. I'm just fortunate to get a pulpit. Um, so I'll just say that that's not always all rainbows and unicorns either, because I'm totally affected by the spark that I see or don't see in my audience. Um, so when you guys give your professors like the head nod, like that's like the greatest thing. <laughs> But I, I guess I, I can't, that's, that's, my students stretch, stretch me and challenge me and balance me and have fun with my students, I get all those things. But I'll, I'll tell you that, I'm, that, that there's parts of that, that that I'm not good at too, which is I'm not very good at keeping in touch outside of the classroom, I'm slow to respond to emails, I don't Facebook or LinkedIn, I don't tweet, but you can get me in my office, I'm, I'm all yours. So I do spend some time on the computer for fun in a couple ways. And um, one is I have some websites I check. And one of them, one of my favorites, is called apartmenttherapy.com. And it's about decorating your apartment. And of course, I don't live in an apartment. But what I've, what I've learned is that I actually get a lot of balance by like doing stuff in my, in my house with the curb cottage and the glassware and, and maps and so on. But what I really like about this website is that it's, it's a collection of ideas and questions and many of the topics resonate with me. Even if it's about somebody's one room apartment in New York, I get something out of it for, for my life. And it's where I've learned actually a couple different phrases that I, I have actually put in my house. And one is, the state of your bed is the state of your head. Um, I guess there's data that if you make if you make your bed every day, you, it sets you off on a, a good day. And the other one is just just start, which I which I really like too. So the la so the last topic I'm going to talk about is is what else I I view on my computer and how it's helped me to thinking about how I spend my time and what I do with my day help me come up with these with these big do's. Um, is that I will often, when I'm working, have something playing on Hulu or Netflix. I don't have cable at home because I love bad TV. And so not having cable helps limit, limit me to watch that. But yeah, good bad TV. But um, one of the things I've, I, will, I often have playing in my office on Netflix are, um, they're called 30 for 30, and they are, um, ESPN movies. I just need to give you a little bit of background on this. So, um, apparently ESPN Films, a number of years ago, gave 30 filmmakers the opportunity to, to make documentaries about some aspect of sport that they found interesting. And I have, like, become obsessed with these 30 for 30. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? If you if you, if you don't, you should. You should get Netflix. Yeah, thank you. That's the head nod I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess the thing that really interests me about sports documentaries is, is sport is, 
it's, it's this pageantry and it's this great stuff, but really it's a person against themselves, right? You, only you can get yourself to go to practice, right? Only you can get yourself to go one foot in front of the other. So I think that's why people challenging themselves and, and actually moving forward, is, it really resonates with me. Okay, so just bear with me. So one of, one of my favorites, and I, I also have to preface this by saying I don't know anything about football. Okay, I know, I know nothing about football. I don't really watch sports on TV except for the Olympics, maybe the Tour de France, but I've learned all this from, from 30 for 30. So one of my favorites is, is called Small Potatoes Who Killed the USFL. And, and this is about a league, a football league that existed in the US, maybe, I don't know, it was in the 80s or 90s, but anyway, spring football went away. But there are two scenes that I find myself playing over, I, I, I just, go back and play them again and again. And one is a montage where they show football players dancing on the field um, after touchdowns, in huddles, on the sidelines. They're doing their, their job, but they're just, they're just having fun. They're doing their job, but they're having fun. And I just, I just think they're just having so much fun. Like, yeah, that's a, that's a big do. Just have fun. And the second scene is a set of interviews between Steve, Steve Young and Jim Kelly, and they were both star quarterbacks in the NFL, who, all, who started their career in this league that doesn't exist anymore. And they apparently played this great, this great game that nobody saw. But what they talked about was how, how that game, they challenged each other, and in that game they achieved things that they haven't achieved at other times in their career. The one guy said, I've never thrown for that many yards, and, then, and Steve Young was talking about how as soon as one of them made a move, the other one would make a move, it was just this big deal. And I thought, I thought they, they, like, they, they stretched and challenged each other, and, they, and as a result, they were, both, they were both better. And so I guess it's, I'm kind of, I'm, I guess I, I feel like my, I'm very fortunate that my life has, that I have a lot of scenes like that in my mind that I want to replay, where there was some stretch and some challenge. And there's some balance in there for me, because I have to do that to, to make myself work. But then it's to, it's to have fun, too. So those are... And I'll just tell you that I, I learned that about myself putting together these comments. That, that I'm looking for stretch and challenge with balance so that I'm ready for it. And I just, I just want to and just to have fun. Thanks for staying with me. Say that one more time. Where does your, where did your uh, interest in fruit flies, where did that initiative come from? So that, so my interest in fruit flies came from being a graduate student studying sea urchin development. And I realized that I wanted to be able to examine the cells that I was looking at. I wanted to be able to understand those on a molecular basis. And so, after you complete a PhD, you usually do a postdoctoral fellowship. And so I knew that I wanted to move in assist into a model organism where I could do genetics. So I wrote to nine worm, worm labs and one fly lab. And I ended up in the fly lab. And uh, I, I was a, a novice. Like, for the first six months I was there, I thought that my PI had chosen a different Kirsten Gus because I had no idea anything about flies. So I, those of you in my genetic class who say, I don't know anything about flies, like I relate to that because that happened to me too. But yeah, that's what took me to flies and I just think they're so great that I've stayed with them. Why is sea urchin development? <laughs> because they are, so, so the question was why sea urchin development? And so I, I'll, um, so JJ was shared that, that Academically, genetics maybe wasn't for her. So for me, actually, so this, I don't know who in here has had animal development with me, but in college, I got my worst grade in college in, develop, in animal development, in developmental biology, which is a class I teach now. And I define myself as a developmental biologist. But the reason was, when I got to graduate school, 
the, the pictures of, so, so I, I'll tell more, more of the story. My postdoc, the person who ended up being my thesis advisor, he said, you know, who's here has had animal development? I said, I have. He said, did you like it? I said, I hated it. I got my worst grade in college. And he said, okay, you can run the slide projector. And so I ran the slide projector, and there were these beautiful embryos. Like, they're so aesthetically pleasing. Victoria, when we, when we fertilized the sea urchin eggs in lab a couple weeks ago, I mean, they're just, they're, they're beautiful. That's why. <laughs> okay, ask me how I came to Dickinson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how did you come to Dickinson? So I ended up at Dickinson because, see, this, this is the stuff I should have talked about. This is, preparing these comments was just like a first-year seminar. As soon as you submit the topic, you come up with 10 better ideas that you'd rather do. So, but I just decided to go with it. So, um, I knew as a sophomore in college that I wanted to be a biology professor at a liberal arts college. And I had no idea what it took to do that, and I just kind of, I'm kind of an accidental biologist. I, did, I don't even really know how I ended up as a biology major in college, but I knew I wanted to be a college biology professor because cell biology just like rocked my world. I just thought it was the coolest thing, and hemoglobin. But anyway, I, so I knew I wanted to be at a liberal arts college, and I, um, when I saw the, the job ad for Dickinson, so I, yeah, this is really what I should have talked about, actually. And my criteria for my job were, I wanted it to be a place with good academic rigor with good cycling. Because I figured that the good academic rigor would mean I'd get the opportunity to work with and be inspired by amazing students. And the cycling would be a good um, example of access to the outdoors. Because I knew I, didn't, I wanted to live in a small town. And so when I saw the job ad for Dickens, I said, Carlisle, I bet, I bet that's pretty good around there. So I applied for the job. And when I came here, I, it was like there was a pie, and I was the missing piece. Like, I just, I just knew. But what really sold it for me was that at my seminar, so first of all, those of you in the biology department know that people go to our seminars, which I think is one of the coolest things at the biology department, that everyone goes to the seminars, and a student asked me a question. They asked me if scallop was a hox gene. And I was so, I was just so blown away by that. And it's just, um, and so I, you know, I get, to, I get to be with you people all the time, which is the greatest thing. And so as soon as that happened, I was like, well, I guess I'm moving back to Pennsylvania. So yeah, that's how I, that's how I ended up doing some. Yeah. I don't know if that was the question you were gonna ask. Well, you know, it actually became the answer, because what I was gonna ask you, because you talked about chicken, is a chicken and an egg thing. And I don't know if this makes sense, but since all these people are starting off in a different place and two of us are here, do you think the motivation created the do or the do created the motivation? Did the motivation create the do or the, did the do create the motivation? I think for me, probably the, the Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> because I'm, I don't know if this will link with what you're saying, but I, I guess, you know, I joke in my classes that I see the world as a big cell. Like I call my, my students back there the interactome because they're all related <laughs> to each other. But, and I'm not sure if that, if that just happens to be this, if I'm like wired that way to see, I mean, I'm wired to see patterns. And is this just the, is just, this just the context in which I see those patterns? Or if I, if something different had happened in my life, would I still see patterns, but I'd be an architect or I'd be, both my siblings are mechanical engineers. And so, which, you know, would I have been a mechanical engineer or something would have happened differently? So, I, I, I don't know. You've kind of been touching on this note that um, the way like, the, um, the aesthetics of science is what attracts you to you, uh, what attracts you to science. Is there a way that you communicate that to your students or to people that are around you? 
Did I communicate the aesthetics of science? That you kind of show that the science that science has a deeper meaning to you, to you personally than just you know the implications for for humans. Other than just saying, oh my gosh, isn't that so beautiful? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good um, that's a good question. I don't I don't know. Do I? Do I do I build in the aesthetics of I think so. I mean, the other day when I was talking to you about this, I went to find Professor Guest to ask her about this, and she's like, oh my gosh, JJ, like, I gotta show you something. I gotta show you something. I went to my lab at like 1.30, and I gotta show you this egg. We cracked it open there. It's one of your... Twins. Twin, twin, twin embryos. Yeah. And so, you know, she's like, come by, you know, we, we finish around this time, and I go in, she, you know, takes off the cap, and is just like looking at me to see my reaction. And yeah. she's like... And I think that I react that way because I had you as a professor and seeing a professor like love something and see something I think is, is really powerful. Because you see that connection happening and it, it kind of ripples out. I don't mean to be answering your question. No, no, no. But it's, I mean, yeah, but it's tr it's like, it's. I mean, I've asked, <laughs> I was getting ready for developmental genomics the other day and I printed out a figure for the students that I thought, is it wrong to love an expression pattern? Because I was looking at this expression and I was like asking what is like, is it is it wrong to love this? And so I um, I guess more important than communicating to my students about the value of the aesthetics of science or something is just just that it's okay, you know, that it's it's okay to be that excited about something. Like it's it's okay to it is, it is okay to be that excited about something. Yeah. Um, you talk about shields. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's such an interesting way to put that. Do you feel that when you're standing in front of new students? And is there a way that students can break it? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. And I think I do, I do break it. So like the pictures of the, of the, um, yeah, so the, I know there are moments in my classes where I, where I will have presented something and I'll think, well, should I, should I tell them what I really think about this or should I, and I, and I joke about it and I call it um, pulling back the curtain of Oz. And, and I think that I do, I do do that a little bit, but not everyone's into that. And so it's like, I guess I feel like it's a balance of how much to, um, you know, because honestly, some students just, just want to know what's going to be on the exam, you know? So it's, so it's a balance between, like, it, can I put enough in there to satisfy those students, but the students who um, are going to understand what it's like to love an expression pattern or think an equation is beautiful, are going to like they'll get something out of it too. I don't know. I just I just want to I just want you guys to trust yourselves. Like trust your own creativity, trust your own your like your own inner voice that wants to do something a little differently. Like I just want I just want you to trust that. So I guess I hope that that's what I guess I guess I hope there's enough of that in there that the students will get that. <laughs>